Hello and welcome to Media Monitor on the SABC News Channel, independent and impartial. Now this is where we take a look inside the world of media, analysing the trends, the issues and some of the reporting of uh, some of the week's top stories. I'm Pete Andor. This is what's coming up on the show. We'll be taking a look at the fairness or otherwise of some of the media coverage this past week. Public protector Wasisiwe Mkwebane lashed out against the media saying that the headlines are biased and misleading towards the Chapter 9 institution. She wasn't alone though. Our former Environmental Affairs Minister Nompula Mukanyane, uh, speaking at the memorial service of the late Gavin Watson, said that the media only reported on the bad and the ugly. Yep, we also have uh, our regular features, uh, an update uh, from a country in Africa. And this week's international editor is in Swaziland, where something really special is happening this weekend. We also take you back in history for one of the biggest stories of 1997. Find out what that story was a little later in the show. But uh, don't forget to engage with us on social media, uh, the platform, uh, Twitter, uh, using the hashtag, hashtag, SABC Media Monitor. Hashtag SABC Media Monitor. Really look forward to uh, getting your thoughts on some of the stories on the program today. But first, let's take a look at what's on the front pages of the Sunday papers this morning. And we start with the Sunday Times. And this week, it leads with a story that uh, taxpayers are not going to enjoy, I'm afraid. Yep, the paper's reporting that MPs are resisting any attempts to have their uh, enviable freebies and perks trimmed in any way. Uh, despite most citizens having to do without, some MPs are saying they, weren't, they want even more on top of their free flights, accommodation, meals and uh, salaries ranging between 1.3 million to 2.4 million rand a year depending on what you do in Parliament. Okay, City Press. Well, the Finance Minister Titumboweni is on the front page of the paper this week, apparently facing uh, the wrath of his party, the ANC, over his plan to breathe life into, the, uh, into South Africa's ailing economy. Now, the paper says that there is anger in the ANC and Cabinet about what's being seen as a premature release of his 77-page turnaround plan, saying that he should have consulted wider and perhaps even allowed the President to own the plan that he released on the National Treasury website uh, for public comment. The Sunday Independent, uh, well that front page story there is that of the late Bosasa CEO Gavin Watson and a full investigation that's been launched into the car crash that killed him last week Monday. This is at the behest of the Transport Minister Figalim Balula who's uh, taken this step after seeing the CCTV footage of the crash. The Sunday Tribune has uh, got an intriguing story about a mega mansion that has been built illegally on stolen property. At the center of what's being described as a spiraling land grab saga are several hectares of land, sugar cane farmers, a local chief, and a businesswoman as well as a high-ranking politician. Sounds like the plot of a movie. Well, a local tribal chief apparently has been facilitating the sale of land that belongs to other people. The Weekend Argus also has a story about the probe that's been ordered by the Transport Minister on the fatal crash uh, that killed uh, Gavin Watson. The Watson family also have hired a private investigator to get to the bottom of what may have happened uh, regarding this crash last Monday. All right, so that's your newspapers, but uh, as you know, most people uh, function on uh, digital platforms. So let's see what's uh, making waves on the front, uh, uh, on, on trending on Twitter actually this morning. And these are the top trends. And as you can see, the usual suspects, the sacred space, Sunday morning uh, uh, trending. But I think the biggest trend, because it's the 1st of September, it's spring day, isn't it? and the 1st of September. So those are the biggest trends and of course most people have been sending through their uh, uh, tweets and so on and so forth and some very very interesting ones actually I've got to tell you. And one tradition that I'm not sure whether it's still playing out is this of throwing water over each other. I'm sure the kids are going to have fun. Uh, it's been, it's a nice warm day today so be careful. Someone might do a spring day thing on you but this is my favorite a spring <laughs> on spring day. So that's spring day and that's what uh, is trending at number one today and I guess throughout the course of the day we'll be seeing much more of that. 
Okay, so there's so much to get through on the show this morning and helping us to make sense of these stories. My guest editors today, we welcome back uh, broadcast specialist lecturer at Swana University of Technology, Chamanu Mahadi. Thanks so much indeed. Uh, he's uh, in studio. Welcome to you. Thank you. And uh, joining us uh, from our Durban studios, we have the editor of uh, the Behind the News Network, uh, Joe Mtlanga. Thanks so much indeed for joining us. Welcome to the program, Pra Joe. Thank you, Pete. Right, let's begin the show. Now, the public protector, Busisiwa Mkwabane, says that the media industry is biased against her office. She further stated that the public broadcaster is also biased when reporting about the public protector. Um, Mkwabane was uh, speaking during a panel discussion titled How South Africa's Media Told My Story during the launch of the UWC's Media Society. The issue of being factual factual reporting. I've given the example what the article published by Ferial. I mean, I know she doesn't do that regularly. It was once. And for me, it's giving the reader an opportunity to hear what you've asked. In fact, read what you was asked. What is the response from the public protector? So for me, that is the best we can do as the media. But then um, the ulterior motives, indeed, all of them have ulterior motives. Um, let me explain to you. The very same Iqbal uh, uh, newspapers, there were articles which were wrong, which they published about the public protector, trying to show you that uh, there are no holy cows here. Um, the very same uh, 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 SABC, it's, it's biased against my office. The way I had several interviews with the SABC uh, journalist, there's one, Stephen Crotes, who has uh, written some, I mean, he is working for SABC, SABC, which is a public broadcaster, because he cannot separate himself, himself from the SABC. So there was that a, 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 a biasness. I had a recent interview by uh, Tepiso as well, at the end of the day, there is that biasness. For me, is when I attend this media or the interviews, uh, SABC, one of the interviews I did with uh, Criselda Lewis, you know, you are treated as if, well, there's this interrogation. You are not given an opportunity to present your story. I did an in a interview with uh, Clement Magnatella as well, EWN. Yes, it was an opportunity to just present or engage on issues which are impacting on the office. But the challenge is when it's published, the headlines are saying something totally different. And when you listen to what I'm saying, it's not the case. So I agree there's diversity, but unfortunately, all of them are included. They are not uh, impartial in their reporting. All right, so that's uh, the public protector advocate, Wasisi Wemkwabane, saying that the media is biased and uh, the SABC getting a lashing from her uh, for the way that we've uh, treated her according to her. So let's get a view from our guest editors, what they think about uh, media coverage referring to the public protector. Let me start in Durban, actually, with you, uh, Joe. Um, what's your take? Do you think that uh, the public protector has a case? Good morning, Peter. Um, we, she, yes, uh, I think so, Peter. You, we, we have seen the shift of how the previous uh, public protector was treated uh, compared to what we're witnessing now. Um, there is a huge difference. Uh, it, it, there is a, a push from the media to portray that office to look like it's a new office. It's an office that does not know what it's doing. It's an office that is just uh, starting now. Meanwhile, we, we, we had this office for a while, and the way 
the previous uh, PPs were treated. It's different from how uh, things are done now. I mean, you look at almost all the headlines. You can go on online news. You will see that uh, there is a, a push for the public to perceive or to look at the public protector as somebody who seems to be the enemy of the state. And I don't think that um, that narrative is fair. Um, since sometimes some publications doesn't even give her an opportunity to rectify or, or, or correct certain things. Sometimes you question some journalists the way they're writing as if now there's a particular agenda that is being pushed against that office. So I don't think um, the, the current public protector is getting a fair treatment from the media. She is correct. All right. We'll assess shortly why that might be happening. Shamana, what's your first instinct? Do you think that the public protector is genuinely being uh, biased against? No, thanks uh, and mm -hmm. good morning, Peter. Um, I hold a different view. I don't think uh, there's a push to portray the office of the public protector in a negative mm -hmm. way. Media can only report that which is already uh, in the public interest. Obviously, uh, these are stories that um, uh, are there. For example, if uh, uh, a court uh, rule against the public protector, there's nothing you can do except just to say mm. this is what the court is saying. So I don't think uh, the media will go out of its way to um, try and portray somebody in a negative sense. And, and I can understand. I mean, look, uh, uh, Peter, let's be very frank here. Um, uh, there's a lot uh, that is being contested. Um, the political space, or rather the political landscape, um, uh, is very dirty at the, at the present moment. Emotions are very high. Yeah. And I can understand also how people are going to react to some of these uh, 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 things. Um, yeah, but that's really my take right. So you're saying fair coverage at the moment? No, fair coverage, yeah. um, the, 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 the starting point is just to understand yeah. what is the role of media. You can only report what is, uh, uh, is happening. You know, is happening. Yeah. Uh, Joe, why do you think that, that there might be this negative bias against her? Is, is there an agenda or is it just lazy journalism? Uh, Peter, I, I disagree with uh, my fellow colleague there. Um, you know, in the media, certain things will be reported in a certain way. The story can be there, but the attitude and the angle, how it should be uh, approached, it's very different. So for us to say because the media will repeat, re only report what is there, you only take the facts there and just report them as they are, the angle... We sit and discuss the angle. We sit and discuss the approach. We sit and discuss how the public should perceive our point of view on a particular matter that we are uh, reporting. I, I, I get to uh, be very wary on, on, on how she is approached because uh, the, some of the first cases that she did, it was the, the, the banking sector. And she touched on a very sensitive space. And then the backlash started. So we, we can go on and on about uh, the fact that we say uh, it's because it's, it's, it's journalists are reporting what's there. I mean, there is, why isn't it we have seen the previous PP getting so much coverage like this? It was never negative. It was different. And the very same people that were reporting different from now, it's, it's a different thing again. So I, I see a lot of uh, double standards here. I see a lot of contradiction as far as that is concerned. So I don't really agree that the media will only report what is there. There's an angle. There's a way in which a, a, a people or public perception is driven. So it's not uh, uh, as innocent as it is, as the, the speaker in the studio is saying, to say that the media only report is there. The mandate, yes, is to report. But media is being used as a tool to shift a particular narrative. 
because everyone else now believe now she's a bad girl there's a big shoes to fill she can't do this she can't do a job we don't see the amount of cases that she has started with we don't see the progress we don't see the comparison but now all we are seeing is that she's not doing a good job so i'm thinking that we need to now look at all the angles and say she's not doing this compared to that there is nothing like that. All we said from the time she came on, the media was reporting that uh, she was with the, 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 the former uh, president. This And then on and on and on, it went up to a point where there are certain people who don't really have to read anything. They believe she's bad. And I don't think it's fair. No, thanks, uh, uh, Peter. Let me um, just say I really appreciate um, everything that Joe is, mm. uh, is saying. Obviously, uh, he speaks from his um, you know, point of view. Now, I would have appreciated uh, probably a little bit more if uh, Joe was able to take us through some practical examples to say, uh, here is an example of a story that was covered about the public, I mean, public protector um, this is the angle in which media uh, had taken uh, against this uh, background. You see, those kind of things, I think uh, uh, they would be a little bit more, more helpful. But what I am um, uh, stressing is that I don't think there's anything different. Uh, and I don't think people want to go out to sort of um, uh, put the office of the public protector in a negative uh, a sense. Perhaps what we need to uh, accept or admit is the fact that uh, the, the landscape probably has, has, has changed. Of course, you cannot uh, compare uh, what has been happening in the last um, you know, three or four years to where we are today. I mean, if you take uh, an example, and I'm just going to give you two, two, two things. 2007, December, you're coming out of um, an ANC big conference. A year after, or yeah, call it a year after really, because we have uh, just come out of uh, elections uh, very recently in, in May. So all of these things, there are a serious dynamics that are at, 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 at play, a shift in terms of power. These are some of the things that will... Of course, uh, in, um, uh, encourage some of the things that we have seen. You can also go back and uh, look at the, some of the stories that uh, the public protector has been working on, whether you're talking about Reserve Bank, whether it's uh, uh, Estina. Uh, SARS, Estina, uh, Dairy Farm. You know, all of those things. Obviously, when it is reported in the, in the media, there are people that were involved in those uh, uh, stories. Of course, when those people are reported, probably, I mean, if stories are not favoring, them, they are going to react in okay. a particular way. And that's what we are dealing with here, All my right. good friend Joe. Okay, Joe, um, when we look at the judgments, the judges were quite scathing. Are they also part of the conspiracy? Because the media was quoting what the judges were saying. Um, it, it, you know, Peter, when it comes to this matter, there are I can't remember the name of that particular judge. The certain words that are used, um, I can't remember exact words that she said, but all those things, you'll see that it's in the effort of discrediting that office completely. But was, and it, not, obviously was it not factual, once, though? As, was, was it not factual? No, that is why I'm saying that... Uh, if, if it's factual, how is that factual? If you can see that this person that is reporting on that matter, there's a disgust in the eyes of the judge. Why, why is that? You're supposed to be the judge. You're supposed to look at the facts and state your case. You cannot just come up with something and then you say so much. There's so many words that were used there that shows that they were really completely discrediting that office. They could have used a different approach. So I'm not disputing that the judges are wrong or they're right. I'm talking about the manner in which the cases are handled. Okay. The way in which those things are put forward. It's again pushing that narrative that that office is completely useless. That's what they're saying to the public. That's oh. what I'm saying. It's oh. the attitude in, in, in which that uh, office is treated. That's yeah. my point. Shamano, there was another thing that uh, the advocate said was the attitude of the journalists. It's almost 
They go into these conversations and these interviews in a combative state and saying that um, she is this persona non grata as a starting point. Is there something to that? Well, at least I have not seen, seen, yeah. seen that. Uh, but um, uh, I would want to believe that uh, the role of any journalist is to simply just tell the, the story. Whatever your opinions are about a particular individual, I don't think that really, really matters. Mm. Deal with uh, uh, what the story is, is about. And uh, I don't think anyone needs to be treated uh, in a way that it sort of uh, makes them feel like they are less human. Yeah. Um, whatever the case might be, uh, just deal with uh, the, 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 the facts on the table. All right. Okay. Clearly, this is a conversation that uh, is going to uh, carry on for some time. Even on social media, there's definitely a divide, some people for and some people against. And there's also this confusion about the separation of the person to the office. And sometimes these issues are conflated. Make up your mind about uh, what you're seeing and hearing, but be critical. Don't just follow the last tweet. Think through what you're seeing or what you're hearing and make a decision for yourself. We're going to take a quick break and when we come back, we'll continue with Media Monitor. Welcome back. You're watching Media Monitor. Let's uh, catch you up with some other media stories that uh, played out this uh, past week. Uh, ENCA Director of News uh, Ben Said died this, this past Monday. He drowned whilst he was on holiday with his family in Mozambique. He had uh, just rejoined ENCA after re returning from uh, Turkish international news channel TRT World. And uh, veteran journalist uh, Harry uh, Mashabela also uh, lost his battle with cancer last Friday. Uh, Mashabela worked for a number of uh, newspapers, including The Star, uh, Golden City Post, The Financial Mail, and The Rand Daily Mail. He was a reporter for The Rand Daily Mail in the 1970s when he was arrested, together with many seasoned journalists in the country, under the Terrorism Act. Mashabela was uh, the author of a number of books, including Townships of the PWV, uh, People on the Boil, and uh, Mekugu, uh, uh, Urban African uh, Cities of the Future. Now, Facebook's a plan to hire professional journalists instead of uh, relying solely on algorithms to deliver some news is a positive step, but is a positive step, but is unlikely to shake up an embattled media industry. Analysts say that the uh, social media giant said uh, last Tuesday it would build a small team of journalists to select the top national news of the day to ensure that uh, we're highlighting the right stories. <coughs> Uh, Chinese-born Austrian academic Yang Yangwin was uh, formally arrested in China on suspicion of espionage. Australia's uh, government confirmed on Tuesday. Australian Foreign Minister Maurice Payne said in a statement that uh, her government was uh, very concerned and disappointed by Yang's arrest in the southern city of Guangzhou in January. Australia has denied a writer arrested in China could be a spy. Yang Hengjun is an Australian citizen who has been detained in China since January and only recently formally arrested on espionage charges. It's an offense punishable by death in China. Beijing informed Australian officials Friday Yang's been transferred to criminal detention. Australian Foreign Minister Maurice Payne spoke to the press on Wednesday. We are uh, seeking uh, for Dr. Young's detention, obviously, for him to be released in the first instance, particularly if he's only being held for his political beliefs. Uh, but most importantly, that if he is to be detained, that he is detained in accordance with uh, the expectations accorded to him through conventions and international law. Uh, and they include uh, access to lawyers, they include appropriate uh, conditions of detention. On Tuesday, China's foreign ministry told Australia to respect its judicial sovereignty and warned it not to interfere with China's handling of the case. Yang was born in China and was formerly a Chinese diplomat. He became a prominent online journalist and blogger. On Tuesday, Yang's wife, Yuan Ruijian, also denied he was working as a spy. 
There's no way I can associate him with the word spying. We don't have any contact with the authorities or any government officials. We can't reach them even if we want to. We are just ordinary people. He just wrote some articles. The whole family has collapsed and couldn't believe it. But they are not surprised either because he had been writing articles that are related to politics in recent years. His family had always feared that this day would come. Yuan, who is herself an Australian permanent resident, has also been barred from leaving China. So that's what was happening in the media world this week. But now we go into our news archives. And today we take you back to what was undoubtedly one of the biggest news stories in the world at this time in 1997. The death of Diana, Princess of Wales. This is how the story was told by SABC News. The driver of the car which crashed, killing Princess Diana and her companion Dodi Al-Fayed, had more than double the legal limit of alcohol in his blood. Judicial sources said Henri Paul, who was not a professional driver, but the deputy security chief of the Ritz Hotel, had about 1.7 grams of alcohol per litre of blood, a level which could cause staggering and double vision and make it impossible to drive. French police are still holding the seven paparazzi who pursued Princess Diana and Dodi El Fayad to their deaths yesterday morning. They have seized some 20 rolls of film which the photographers had taken. They are trying to determine whether the paparazzi's hot pursuit of the couple contributed to the accident. This report from the BBC. While feelings run high about responsibility for the fatal accident, there are conflicting details about the circumstances. Two vehicles set off from the Ritz Hotel on Saturday night. A Range Rover with the Al Fayed's official driver, a decoy which lured away half a dozen waiting photographers. And then the Mercedes, driven from the rear of the hotel with the Princess of Wales in it. It also was pursued by paparazzi on motorbikes. The Mercedes was armoured and therefore somewhat unwieldy. It's thought to have entered the underpass at at least 100 miles an hour. Today, the French police say that Henri Paul, who died in the crash, had over three times the legal level of alcohol in his blood. All right, so that was the top story, 1997, one of them certainly for that year. And that, of course, happened on the 31st of August, 1997. And 22 years later, I'm not sure that we're 100% certain what happened uh, underneath that tunnel. And that was Alice Chavanduka taking us uh, back in time uh, on our special feature. All right, we're going to take a look at our newspapers uh, shortly. And uh, we're going to start actually in Swaziland because this weekend is a big cultural weekend. Find out why. between Alexandra residents and police. Following a forced eviction, officers retaliated by firing rubber bullets. They just shoot at us. They don't even want to listen to us. They've done us wrong as a community. What, what created the situation? What led to these angry words being exchanged? You're forcing me to say I have doubt. What, what is that? Thing? Don't treat me like a small boy. Don't do that. Because Human Rights Commission, Human Rights Commission is not God. Avuzimusi Jamini, he's the senior investigator there, and he asked the question, can we just explain what this particular project did? Uh, because of course, uh, there were a lot of money uh, in that particular project, but it looks like little has been delivered.
Right, it's time now for us to take a look at what's happening in the media and the newspapers in a short while. But first, our international editor, uh, we're joining him, is on uh, 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 the line from Swaziland. And it's a huge weekend culturally for uh, Swaziland. And we find out now by the, from the editor of the online news portal Swaziland News, Zweli Martin Dlamini. Thanks so much indeed for joining us. It's spring, spring day, but it's a really important weekend culturally for your country. Why is that? Um, yes, it, uh, this is a very, very important uh, event in the cultural calendar of the Kingdom of Swaziland. Today, we are having the Umshanga Red Dance Ceremony. This is a ceremony of young girls, uh, particularly those who are regarded as virgins. Uh, this is where they are told about uh, cultural values, how to preserve themselves and how to to behave in a, in, in a good manner. But uh, normally it is uh, highly expected in other events such as this one where the king uh, chooses a wife. But, uh, you know, Peter, is not predictable. Sometimes <laughs> he, he picks one, sometimes he doesn't. All right. So why, why is this such an important event? Why is it such a, a big event in, in the country? Yeah, uh, it's a big event because, uh, because um, it attracts uh, the world to Eswatini. Mm. Uh, many tourists uh, visit the Kingdom of Eswatini to, to witness this event. So uh, as, as we speak, uh, most of the hotels here are, are fully booked. So it, we regard it as a big event on that aspect. And, and the, another thing, it's, uh, uh, many non-governmental organizations, they see this opportunity uh, to educate young girls uh, on how to, particularly on their rights, on their, on their, on their rights, uh, they regard these, these young girls as uh, future mothers. So they see this opportunity to tell them regarding women's rights. So it's not only a, a cultural event that, that attracts uh, traditionalists, they, it's, all, it's, it's also now involves many, many um, non-governmental organizations and the international community. How many uh, young girls are we likely to see today? I believe it's starting uh, sometime this afternoon. Um, just give us a sense of size and numbers. Um, it's, a, it's close to, but it's more than 50,000. Wow. Between 50 and 100,000, yeah. All right, explain but this. Also, also it, yeah, yeah explain, explain the significance of the reeds that they carry. Um, it, traditionally, uh, uh, when, when, when a young girl uh, carries the, the reeds, that 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 it regards them as the pride. It, 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 that that young girl prides herself as a, as a virgin, and they, they come together and dance before they are king. So it, it it's a cultural event that encourages young girls to to behave in a, in, in a good manner until they become mothers. All right, so you said that uh, we're not sure whether the king is going to choose a wife today. How does it normally happen? Is it, did they, d does he just pick from the women uh, among can you them? Repeat again, Peter? I was just saying we're not sure if the king will choose a wife today, but how does it normally happen? Does he choose amongst the, the, the young women that walk past, or is there a process that takes place before? <laughs> Uh, there are many processes which are, that <laughs> take place behind the scenes, and uh, I will make an example. He, he normally sends emissaries uh, to to identify that uh, that young girl, which he, he thinks can be his uh, next wife, and then that young girl is then expected to to attend the wedding, and that is where. Uh, the full the full process is then com is com then complete. It's not it's not just that they just uh, parade before him and then he picks. He doesn't do that. It's, it's normally send a missionary to identify, or if maybe he, he saw that young girl somewhere, 
then that young girl will then be expected to attend the reason so that uh, he can undergo the cultural processes of becoming uh, the king's next wife. All right. And how many how many wives does the king have at the moment? <laughs> um, now he's about 14, there are about 14, 14 wives. Wow. That's, and each one has a yes. palace of sorts, I guess. Sorry? And each one has a palace, I guess. Yes, each one has a palace, um, and some escorts, including other benefits. Yes. All right. Uh, Zweli, we're going to leave it there. Thanks so much indeed for joining us and uh, giving us uh, the update on uh, what's happening today. A big social cultural event there. Uh, the annual reed dance taking place and uh, the king may or may not have a new wife. Uh, but uh, we'll be reporting on that uh, certainly on uh, our news programs a little bit later on. All right, let's take a look at uh, what's happening in our newspapers as we come back home. And I'm going to go to Durban and start uh, with Joe. Uh, Joe, uh, t tell us one story that intrigued me in particular was this Sunday Tribune front page. Um, what is this about a local chief facilitating the sale of land that belongs to other people? Is that what's happening? Uh, Peter, the, the issue of the land, uh, it, uh, you can call it part of the national crisis yeah. uh, because now the, the chief believes uh, he owns the land um, and he believes his people are not uh, um, living in a proper land or, or landscape. He believes that people are staying in the very skewed uh, um, Places there. So, what has been happening now? The the, the so-called rightful owners of the land having a problem with that because the chief. Uh, it is alleged that uh, the land is being sold from uh, uh, thirty thirty thousand to two hundred thousand. So again, that is another thing that he, if he was giving the land to his people, I mean, why would you sell it uh, the land for so so much? Mm. And I mean, if you look at the people that are building there, you can tell that these are the people that can really afford because you look at the houses that are in that area; uh, these are big houses. So there is uh, 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 and also uh, a problem between the Ingonyama Trust and, and the, the farmers that are owning that land. So, and it even went to a point where it's now in the court because the two Indunas were the ones that were facilitating the sale of the land um, uh, as far as this matter is concerned. But it is a big issue. So from your reading, I mean, what, what, what is actually going on here? We've got jurisdictional issues where chiefs, believe that they are in control on how land should be dispossessed, I mean, uh, um, uh, disposed of, um, or is, am I misreading the situation? Uh, I, I think there has to be, there's still an issue, uh, Peter, as far as the, the clear lines are concerned here. Yeah. Uh, there's a land that will be controlled by a municipality, there's a land that is controlled by Ingonyama Trust, and there's a land that is controlled by a provincial government. So because things are not so clear, and those people that are there, they said they bought the land, they have the title deed. And uh, the chief says, this is our land. I cannot allow my people to live in the cliffs while you guys own this big piece of land. So it, it's, an, it's, a, it's an area that is very sensitive that the sooner the, the, the national government or the ruling party pronounce how will be the way forward as far as this land issue is concerned. Because from what I can read here, it's still going to go on. We have uh, cases where some other places, the farms, in case and where people just invaded, start cutting the land and, and, and moving in there. So uh, the, the, there's a very fine line where the Ingonyama Trust, the local government, the provincial government, the national government, the ruling party in parliament to pronounce the way forward on the land because it's getting worse from uh, what I can read here. The fact that it's already in the court, but the properties are already up. So it is a challenge. Yeah. So Manu, this land question is, 
it's just going to continue to be looked at and debated in various ways. And jurisdiction um, mm -hmm. uh, is a chief, an ordinary citizen, mm -hmm. or a paramount ruler of some kind. And mm -hmm. I guess the constitutional court's probably going to have to step in in a number of these cases. No, without doubt, Peter. I think uh, it's going to continue to be a matter of uh, you know big debate in in South Africa, how do you go about it? Obviously, it's also a, a thorn, I mm. can imagine, in uh, the flesh of those that are expected to come up with uh, really uh, some of these yeah. uh, decisions. Whatever you do in the case mm -hmm. of what we are now seeing, um, you know, in KZN, is it a case of, um, you know, a precedent? How do you yeah. uh, go about it? So. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's a subject which uh, I think for, for many years, I would say it has been uh, uh, sort of put under the carpet. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, without land, there's no way that you will have means of production. That, that's, yeah. that's just the bottom line. And I think uh, South Africans uh, have to face this one uh, head on. All right. Is there a story that grabbed your attention in any of the papers? Yeah, there is a story, Peter, but maybe before we, yeah. we get to it, can I just uh, for a moment yes. just um, uh, send really my deepest condolences mm. to uh, a man I knew very closely, mm. uh, Ben said, uh, who right. was with us uh, in the early 2000s. Yeah. But one of the things that I wish to just say about Ben is that um, Ben, and I hear so many people have said so many things, he was really good at what he was, um, you know, uh, doing. I remember there was a time when Ben was, could have just become anything or probably an anchor. But Ben refused uh, and he always wanted to be, uh, you know, uh, in the field, yeah. reporting stories. Even at the time when he became a, a group news editor, you would have seen uh, the work that he has done, especially with the uh, funeral of uh, former statesman uh, Nelson uh, Mandela. Mm. Uh, so somebody who I think uh, has contributed immensely to the broadcast uh, media industry in this country, uh, particularly the formation of the first 24 News Hour channel in South Africa in the name of um, you know, ENCA. So I really say to uh, his wife, Nikki, and the kids, yeah. our deepest condolences yeah. indeed. No, certainly a, a great loss. And I think uh, throughout uh, social media in particular, I think people were paying great tribute to, to his work and his life. That's right. All right. So, so the, story that I was, uh, the story that I was looking at, uh, Peter, it's on uh, page 11 of the, the City Press, uh, Smoke, Mirrors, and Agrizi. So this is um, the story about uh, some uh, family members that are basically um, uh, saying... This is Watson death, right? Yeah, the Watson uh, yeah. death. Um, uh, so we know about this, this character. I mean, some yeah. uh, people who worked very closely with him, who uh, are not really identified here. They call him vindictive and schoolyard bully. So... Yeah, describing a greasy or describing a greasy. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, the, <coughs> the 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 story of um, Gavin Watson uh, it's going to continue um, to be talked about. Obviously, given uh, what is already in the in the in the commission, mm. his death obviously comes at the time when there were a lot of expectations in terms of uh, answers that needed to be uh, uh, rather questions that yeah. needed to be answered. All right, so gentlemen, I'm going to ask us to look again at uh, the fairness of coverage because Environmental Affairs Minister, former Environmental Affairs Minister Nomvula Mukonyanu, uh, at uh, Watson's uh, memorial service, uh, lashed out at the media again, saying that this was, uh, we reported only on the bad and the ugly. Let's take a listen to what she said and then we'll discuss uh, if there's any merit to her thoughts. What News 24 is reporting is about a former minister of water who was given chicken pieces and whiskey who is here. My time will come, I will tell you what Gavin has done. All right, so Joe, uh, a very angry uh, former minister of environmental affairs saying that uh, we... Don't tell these pro stories properly again. And I'm, let's talk about Gavin Watson in particular, actually, not even the minister. Um, and this is a man who has genuine struggle credentials. 
and some would say that post that he may have fallen by the wayside if we are to base on the things we've heard in the uh, state capture inquiry. This is a difficult story to tell. It's clear that we're not just one thing. Do you think the media has done a fairly good job in trying to, cr to paint a picture of a whole person? Um, th thanks, Pete. I, yeah. I think uh, we all know that uh, Gavin assisted. Um, he, he, he assisted uh, the ruling party uh, in many things. Um, we, the, we have seen stories in, in the media, but uh, most of those stories are reported from Agri's point of view. Because we, we, we well, firstly, uh, Gavin Watson was never found guilty in any court of law uh, that I must indicate. So most of the things that we read about, it's the evidence that was led by Angelo Agritz in the state capture. So everything that we are reading on the man, it's what Agritz told us. So, and unfortunately, uh, it was not really tested whereby we got the man to speak. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, passed on before he speak for himself, where we could hear his side of the story. So for me, I was one person that was uh, waiting for the day in which where Gavin Watson will appear so we can hear his side of the story. Um, yes, um, he, because it was one-sided story, because it's one angle that we had from Angelo Agrid and few other guys that uh, came to the state capture. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, that is the last part of the of the story that we have. It's it would be one-sided. He's gone. He's not going to speak for himself. So, for me, I would have been uh, in a position to want to hear himself speak mm -hmm. and say this is correct, this is not correct, because as it is, it's one-sided. And I'm going to stick to that. Uh, that. That's what it is. So whatever that we have read or we have seen, it's what was told by this uh, other side. side of the story from his opponent. Right. We have not heard his side. Okay, so it's a difficult story to tell. And, and this is a man who, you know, depending who you talk to, had very different interactions with many people. Mm. There's the struggle credentials, there's the party man, there's uh, the father, and there's this God-fearing person. Mm -hmm. And then this man that's also been described in a different way, the State Capture Commission. How do journalists put all of this together? <laughs> Peter, it's a tough uh, balancing act. Um, you know, uh, people do so much, which is good, but... Um, uh, the, the, the problem becomes when uh, there's just this thing that sort of, uh, uh, call it a, a dark shadow, right? Um, uh, in the case of what we have uh, uh, seen with uh, Gavin Woodson, you, you, you would remember even yeah. the video uh, showing him packing some stacks of money. And, you know, it's all of that. But um, uh, depending on who you talk to, like you're saying, I mean, the kids would tell you of how brilliant the, their father was. Uh, as a, as a, I mean, from a, a politics side of things, uh, how he has contributed, uh, you know, to the to the to the struggle. So it's all of these uh, uh, things that um, uh, you just find yourself mm -hmm. really uh, dealing with. Uh, so the summary of it, from my side, really, I would say it's it's, it's quite a difficult mm -hmm. one. But uh, how do you then tell that that story? There has to be. Uh, uh, some kind of um, yeah. uh, balance uh, in as much as you would have uh, the negative but what are some of those good that, um, uh, that, that you know this does. person has contributed yeah all right so joe a question for you uh, that i was asked by somebody this past week um, at his memorial service a number of uh, journalists spoke to the brother uh, of uh, gavin watson and some started to ask questions about the state capture inquiry. And this person said to me, is that the appropriate time for a journalist to talk about something like that to somebody who's about to bury his brother? Is there such a thing as appropriate times for asking questions or is it fair game? I've always said that politicians never get a day off. 
but a private citizen, your thoughts? Um, it, it said how in the media, we, the, the extent, the length we go uh, in order to get the news. It, it, it was, it, 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 it said when we ask such questions, I mean, we, we could wait for the family, we could respect people. Uh, it's not the first time to, for certain things to happen like that. Uh, we have seen where sometimes certain journalists will cross the line and ask such questions during that time. As for me, I, I would say it's, it's, it's a very unfair, we're playing rough when we do that. Um, sometimes there's pressure from our editors to say, no, ask these questions, get it done. Uh, we push the cells up in the name at expense of the people. They, some of, of the people that are late, their families, we, we don't think of the children, we don't think of, of being sensitive, we don't think of being human at that side. We just want to become ruthless and just get the story and get out. And then now, if we were to think about it, would you, would you, if it should be in a position like that, would you accept it if it happens to you where you get to be questioned like that? Sometimes as a media, we have to ask those questions at the wrong time. We have to ask wrong questions at the right time. So uh, again, it's a 50-50. It depends on the mandate of um, those journalists what it is. But personally, I would say it's unfair to ask the brother who just lost. Sometimes you'll find that uh, that person is not even buried, but outside, those are the questions that the media would be asking. It is unfair. Shamana, your thoughts? Is there such a thing as inappropriate questions at certain times? Peter, timing is very important. Um, I think in this particular um, uh, you know, case, obviously, uh, for somebody who has just mm -hmm. lost uh, a brother, uh, I think it would be uh, difficult to even uh, think of uh, questions around uh, state capture, uh, as we now understand it, uh, a question was, was, was asked. So, I would be reluctant. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be. I would be uh, reluctant, um, uh, given the, the 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 circumstances. It doesn't mean those questions um, should not be asked. Mm -hmm. But it's just a matter of uh, where you find yourself. Where are you asking this question? Who are you talking to, or who are you asking these questions to? So, yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, frankly speaking, I think I will be a little bit more uh, reluctant. All right. Yeah. Okay. So as we start tying things up, Joe, what do you think is going to be big in the news uh, this uh, coming week? Is there something that we need to be looking out for? I suppose this probe into the crash could be one of the things. Uh, is there anything else that comes to mind? Uh, Peter, there's very interesting... Um, things that are picked up in the, in the Sunday, Sunday Tribune. Yeah. The, the loose ends uh, in the Gavin Watson's death. Yeah. Uh, they're speaking of the cell phone, airport ticket, accident scene, the neck wound. These are the things that are going to be guiding the way forward. Uh, I see some colleagues did a lot of work in terms of tracking uh, the cell phone that uh, was picked up in um, uh, uh, Brinstein, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the issue on the airport ticket, the issue on the accident scene. So I think the more um, the story unfolds, the more the story comes up, the more all these details come up, we will be able to have a clear picture as into what happened because it's still fuzzy. Yeah. It's still not clear. I mean, there's a lot of things that are spoken yeah. on the ground right. um, where we, we're not we're really running getting out of time, into Joe. the bottom. Of it. We're running out yeah. of time, so I want to say thank you very much to you. But in 20 seconds, I suppose, we still have to solve the issue of the mayor of Eteguin. No, uh, that, that, that's a big one, Peter. Uh, I mean, uh, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's been a big one. Uh, the one moment uh, somebody has resigned, the next moment, uh, oh back. no, actually, uh, it Change was a mistake. I sent it by, by, by mistake, so I still want my job back, yeah. you know. So, but yeah, let's wait and let's see. Let's see what happens. Yeah.
Shamana, thanks very much indeed. Thank Joe, you so much. thank you very much indeed for your inputs. And to you at home, thank you so much indeed for watching uh, the show today. Join us again next week for more Media on Monitor. Have a great spring day and uh, summer is just around the corner. Have a good one, everybody. Bye-bye.